Shelter insurance has covered a lot of miles and a lot of cars and drivers since 1946. We like knowing we have you covered, so you can just sit back and enjoy the ride. Shelter insurance. We're your shield. We're your shelter. Ask Shelter Agent Mark Manning about Shelter's competitive insurance rates. For years, the battle has raged about who has more spirit, Newport Greyhound fans or the Baseball Pioneer fans. Let's see if we can go find out. I was a student trainer for the Pioneers, and I can tell you that no other team plays with as much heart and soul as they do. Go Pioneers! I've been a Greyhound football fan for over 50 years, and we all know there's magic in those orange helmets. 50 years, I didn't know we were competing on who had the oldest fans. I thought we were talking about who had the best team, and uh, you're going to need some magic because Pioneer never quits. Give me just a second, I'm allergic to dogs, I've been sneezing all day. Damn. Yeah, Pioneer never quits. Greyhounds have the best fans because we keep the tradition going from generation to generation. Go oh, wow. <laughs> The Pioneers have my heart, and the coaches dream of this game all year long. Yeah, they're dreaming about winning. I was a Pioneer cheerleader, and I know the Pioneer fans are always on point. As a former Greyhound lineman, I learned that Newport fans and the players always have each other's back. I'll pass on being anything other than a Greyhound. While this score may never be settled, one thing is for certain. Both have limitless enthusiasm for their teams and their towns. And at the end of the game, or the work day, we are not divided by our differences, but united by our passions. On a real breezy, cool, <laughs> sunny morning, Mr. Ted Hall from White River Area Agency on Aging joins us at the Jackson County Senior Life Center. Absolutely, absolutely, a great place. How's Mr. Ted Hall? I'm, I'm good. You know, uh, Dave, one reason we wanted to come here today, just to remind people, even though our seniors cannot go into the Senior Center, we have curbside service uh, out here. They can come by and get a meal. Uh, so, of course, meals on wheels as we, out in the community and the county, that continues on. But uh, anyway, we, we love our senior center. We love Jackson County. We love this facility, how it's been remodeled. And uh, we're just really proud. And they are, Dave, you wouldn't believe the number of people that we increased since we moved to this building. Right, right. So we're really proud of that. And uh, we've got room for more. <laughs> and what a partner Unity Health has been. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, yeah, it's just a great deal for, for Newport and Jackson County, but it's a good thing. Uh, for those of us deal with senior centers. So, hey, Dave, we're in changing times right yes, now. Yes, sir, we are. And uh, we, we are. were talking before uh, before we come on camera today. You, you know, you kind of have to look at this. Uh, it is what it is. And uh, it just shows you that we're not in control and that uh, there is a, a, a something out there that we need to look forward to. And uh, there's hope out there. And so that's really kind of what we do. And uh, it's interesting, David, that uh, during this whole virus, you know, those of us that work with seniors, we're still out there plugging away. <laughs> and uh, now we take precautions. We have a protocol before our aide goes into the home, make sure that they feel good and they take their temperature and they wash their hands and all the kind of things like that. So at this point in time, we continue to serve people and we don't have any 
somebody with this crazy virus that we're dealing with. But that doesn't mean that it won't happen. But uh, we're trying to make sure that we're still serving seniors and uh, and making sure that uh, we're taking care of them. So uh, I also talked to David that today uh, we want to talk about the Area Agency on Aging, not just the 10 counties that we serve, but also the whole state. David, we have seven other folks. They do similar to what we do, but we all basically take care of seniors. Right, absolutely. And uh, I, I mentioned also, to David, that we have right now 350,000 meals are being served today throughout the state of Arkansas. Wow, that's awesome. That, and so that's, you know, that just shows you really a value of what, uh, what we're all about. And also we have over 100,000 people that are being served in homes, which means we're giving baths, we're cooking for them, we're cleaning their houses, and uh, we're doing those important things that sometimes when you get older, and I understand that, we just can't do what we used to do, and that's kind of what we do. Uh, we are paid through Medicare and Medicaid, but we also have self-paid. Uh, we have veterans programs that people can do, and then we take long-term insurance. So it's just a matter we can work with people. They just need to give us a call. I always use the number at our office there. Basically, it's eight seven zero six one two three thousand, and we can get you someone calls and they have questions. We'll get them to the right county, or if there's information they need to know something about, we can help them with that too. Mr. Ted, I think sometimes we as a general public just really forget what your agency does yes. and how much you do for seniors. Just for example, Nanette Cooper, who uh, yes. runs, she, she, just, she walks out here and visits with us momentarily. She says, you know, we're serving a bunch of meals. We're taking care of a bunch of people. And, the, and she said, but the most important thing, she said, the people miss coming, coming. here. <laughs> she just said that. Yeah. So I think, I think we as a community and we as a society really Really, sometimes either mis misunderstand or don't under don't understand, or just really can't appreciate as much what you guys do for the seniors and for the community and for the people. I mean, it's a vital part of life for these people to, to have you guys. And, and Dave, that just goes right into the next thing that we're talking about. You know, one of the serious problems we have with seniors right now, not just because of this virus, but the idea of the isolation issue. I'm lonely. I need somebody to talk to. Well, Meals on Wheels, I just saw the vehicle just pass right there. Uh, they, those drivers, they are invaluable they to are. us and certainly to Unity as they go out and they visit with people. And you'd be surprised how many just in knowing uh, those people come by, how much better they feel about things. And also it gives a hint if that driver may come back and make a call to somebody that they somebody may need some help that, they, that right. nobody would recognize it wasn't for those drivers that's exactly and it's right. just we just have story after story and so you know that's the nice thing about this job Dave you do when I was superintendent of schools I'd get a lot of calls uh, you know just stuff that <laughs> it, uh, it was important because it's important to those parents right, absolutely but, you know I get lots of calls in this particular job is that hey thank you for what you do Thank you for taking care of my folks, taking care of this person or that person. So, you know, we're just important. And we that's the reason why, David, that we need to make sure that our governor, our the folks at Department of Human Services, our elected officials, just continue to support what we do. And, uh, you know, we try to balance what we do, you know, but we still have to pay salaries. We still have to have money to operate. So that that's really our call. And, and right now, uh, talking about money is not a great thing because we're in the situ situation with the virus. And so it's going to take probably a little time before that can happen, getting us back really where we should be as far as the rate that they pay us to do what we need to do. But anyway, we're all about seniors, and uh, we're going to try to continue to take care of them and uh, do the right things. And uh, I know we probably got a little longer today than we normally, but uh, anyway, David, thank you for what you do for us. And, and certainly all the area agency on aging throughout the state of Arkansas appreciate the support from our communities and from all the people that that help us. So we, we just say thank you. Well, again, and I know you say thank you from the bottom of your heart because you guys are taking care of a lot of folks that need help right here in Newport, Arkansas, in Batesville, 10 county area, just with your group, the other seven that you mentioned around the state of Arkansas. This is a fantastic program. Thank you, Mr. Ted Hall. Uh, thank you. White River Area Agency on Aging in Newport and Batesville. Well, 
Well, and through the magic of video, it's Tara Salinas at Merchants and Planners Bank. And Tara, first of all, I want to make sure it's okay that we record here on Skype. Yes, absolutely. Well, Merchants and Planners Bank and doing business uh, the hometown way may have changed somewhat <laughs> over the course of the <laughs> yeah, week. This has changed. This is different. We're not face to face. We're video chatting. I'm coming to you from my office, you from yours. Um, Wearing pants and everything. Hope you are too. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And, and you and I both technologically challenged to get this thing on to make it work. And yeah, we're not going to tell everybody how long it took us to, to make this happen. But um, <laughs> hey, it's, it's an opportunity to learn new things. And, um, you know, again, it is different. We're doing things in a way we didn't anticipate. Um, but we're learning a lot and there's a lot of good things coming from it. So first and foremost, want to tell everyone, we miss you. <laughs> we miss seeing your faces. Um, you know, about, um, the end of March, I think we closed the lobbies off, um, just to limit contact and limit exposure. Um, we didn't want to do it, but we, you know, we felt it was necessary for the safety of everyone. And so we have been working with everyone through our drive throughs and on the phone. And um, a lot of people have adapted our digital or our online banking platforms. And so, like I said, we have really used this as an opportunity to learn how to do things, the, the same old things in new ways. So first and foremost, thank you to everyone, to all of our customers who have been so patient and so adaptable. Um, a huge thank you to our staff because they really you know, they just, they show up and they get ready, they put their gloves on and they work hard all day. And like I said, they have really, they've been very great and adaptable too. And they've also continued to, you know, as much as possible, keep that community bank feel and that personal feel. And so I'm just proud of all of them and um, <clears throat> thankful to work with such a great group. Well, it's a, it's a little bit different because uh, of the banking and the banking services that we still have. I mean, it, it, we, we still provide all the services that we do. It's just that we're not, it's walking in and doing banking has changed for the time being. For the time being, yeah. Um, and like I said, we do, you know, we're, we're fortunate to be able to offer a lot of online services. So, you know, if you have a net teller online bank account, you can really, you know, do most of your business from the comforts of your living room. Um, you can log in and check your balance. You can transfer money. Um, if you need to make a loan payment, you could transfer money over to your loan account um, and make that payment without, you know, having to, you know, leave the comforts of your home. <clears throat> you can pay your bills online. Sure. We have a bill pay tab that will allow you to set up all of your um, all of your bills for each month and just go in there and, you know, it automatically drafts. You can tell it when to, um, you have a lot of control over it. And then we also have our person to person payment feature, which I've been using a lot lately. It's, you know, just like PayPal, you send money to your friends and to your family or to charitable organizations. Um, you know, I paid church with it. So you just, you, you download it uh, with our app and you put someone's information in and you set them up as a payee and send them money whenever you want. Oh, Once they're in there, they're in there and it's fast and easy and it's free. So, you know, and it's from your bank. There you go. Party vendor. So anyway, a lot of good services. We have a, um, a page on our website that will address pretty much any of the questions or issues that anyone would have and kind of take you through how to do everything. So if you have questions, look at our website or give us a call and we can walk you through anything. Um, but yeah, our online banking and our mobile app, there are great resources right now and they're being very heavily used. Okay. What's the website? What number should we call? Okay. So you can call, you can log on to www.mnp.bank or mnpbank.com um, or just Google MNP Bank. Sure. And um, you can call us here at 870-523-3601. This is our home base and that's our home base number and we can get you wherever you need to go from there. 
we also, for the people that are not online, you know, we realize that's not everyone's um, cup of tea. And so we do have a telephone banking hotline. Yeah. You'll have to call into us and we can set you up on it. But this will allow you to call in and check your account and see what transactions have gone through, you know, see if you've gotten any deposits. Um, it'll be especially helpful for people that are waiting for their stimulus checks to arrive. Um, you can call day or night anytime and see what's in your account. So that's a great option as well. Um, and like I said, they could just call into us and we can set them up and walk them through it. Well, I do know this, that, uh, you know, our hometown bank doing what we have to do to uh, take care of all of our customers and our clients. And you guys are just simply awesome. What you're doing is it's just like finding out a new way to do interviews. And, and uh, I mean, here we are, Tara Salinas and David Black Skyping, and we're not in our 20s. I'm certainly not in my 20s. You're in <laughs> your you're late 20s and I'm early 60s. Just, <laughs> just, just, just a little bit out of it. I appreciate you taking time to join us. And I know you guys are doing all you can do to make everybody safe. We are. We are. We, like I said, we just, we appreciate you. We appreciate our customers so much. Um, you know, we appreciate our staff, like I said, and, and a side note to just the great appreciation for everyone here. Um, you know, our lending staff have, have, they've been working around the clock with all of the SBA offerings. Um, yeah. They want to do everything they can to help our small businesses because they're so vital and so important to our communities. And we understand this. And so, you know, just kudos to them for giving everything they have and being here, like sleeping here you know, nights and weekends to take care of the customers. So uh, they've been amazing. So big thanks to them. Tara Salinas at Merchant Suppliers Bank, our hometown bank in Newport, Arkansas. We thank you, girl. Thank you. Stay you see success like the Loch Ness. I see the challenge and I say, man, I got this. But I'm picking at the problems and probably making it worse. I'm patching up the weakness before they hit that first. They want to get the riches, but they don't want to work. That laziness is basically a curse. And I just want it more so I get it. I'm not playing. I'm not stopping. Your hurt feelings are not close to my problem. Get that money. Hey, Johnny, don't call me lucky. This once again is Marty Bain Brown at Farmer's Tire Mart where the rubber meets the road and we're on beautiful Highway 367, 167, Malcolm Avenue. We're in Newport, Arkansas. I've been there a long while, haven't absolutely. we? Absolutely. I believe Mom and Dad's in their 28th year. Wow, that is absolutely fantastic. 28 years of taking care of folks in Newport, Jackson County, and surrounding areas. And one thing that we want to talk about today, Marty, is it's that time of year. It's springtime, and and uh, people are going on trips, and it. it they need to have their automobiles checked out, and we have a wide variety of things that we do for an automobile. Let's talk about some of those things that we do to get your automobile ready for these trips that we're going to take. Right. We, um, you know, maintenance is the is the best money on a vehicle that you will ever spend. Um, you know, because it, it costs a little bit to maintain instead of costing thousands of dollars to repair later yeah, on. No doubt. Um, it, oil changes, um, change your spark plugs and wires, um, you know, flush your, your coolant system, flush your transmission, um, clean your uh, injectors, your fuel injectors. Sure. Sure. You know, there's so much carbon in the fuel now, it builds up and it causes your vehicle to be a little bit sluggish. So we want to clean those. We do, we do a lot of things here. You, you mentioned the oil changes, which people you know, would normally you know, really get their oil change, but then there's a lot of things other than that that you don't think about, and, and even in preparation, it's suspension work, or just checking out a suspension. And when we do an oil change, we're going to check a lot of things. That's right. That's right. We are going to check a lot of things. We're going to check all your fluids. We're going to check your belt. We're going to check... Um, you know, to make sure everything's tight under the front end, um, we're going to check your tires. Even, you know, even if you're just getting an oil change, we're going to set your pressures and, and make sure everything's good. One thing about, you know, you, you mentioned checking the pressure of tires, and you ought to do it more often than just when you get an oil change because tire pressures can do one of a couple of things. Number one, uh, if you have low pressure, 
I mean, or extremely high pressure, you, you're getting extra wear and tear on your tire. And the other thing, it affects gas mileage. Absolutely, it affects gas mileage. People don't realize that. You know, when it when the weather gets cool, you know, the, the air contracts and it and it, you lose air pressure. And so it's almost like you're driving on a flat tire. Right. And we don't want to do that because that'll break down the, the wires and the belts and the tires, causing a lot of damage. But then when the weather's warming up now and when it gets hot, that air expands. And um, that's when we see a lot of blowouts on the road. Yeah, no doubt. The... Uh a lot of these automobiles today have the little warning lights, but there's a lot of them that we service that don't have those warning lights, and and so it's good to bring them in and get them checked and, and uh, j just check the air pressure. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of being all three or four pounds, and you just you know you know uh, Bruce uh, and the guys in the back, and uh, I mean just put your little air in there, it may be all you need. But so important to to do pre maintenance check on these automobiles not just this time of year, but because it is getting warmer and because you are going to be going on some trips, it's a great time to do that. But uh, uh, you need to have your service schedule th throughout the course of the year. You need to do it three or four times a year, that obviously. Is, that is so important. It is so important to do that. Um, of course, you know, right now everybody's getting ready to go on spring break trips. Right, right. And, and they're going to go in their vehicles right now. They're not going to fly. That's right. Um, but... Let us check it out before you go. Um, it, it's much better to, to check it out and, and there be nothing wrong than to not get it checked and, you know, 100 miles down the road, you have a big problem. And when you have a big problem and you're 100 miles down the road, you're out of town and you pull into the nice, friendly service folks and they know that you're from out of state, and they go, well, 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 looky that, what we got right. here. That's they right. don't get treated. You don't get treated on the road the way you get treated at Farmer's Tire Mart in Newport, Arkansas. When that's right. Unfortunately, you know, that that's that's tend to be the, the beast of the business there. But, um, you know, if you've got a low tire, don't just come in and ask for air in it. Let's find out why it's low. Why it's low? <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've had people, you know, just traveling through that'll come in and say, oh, I just need a little air in my tire. I'm on my way to Little Rock. And I'll say, well, let's find out why you Very need important. a little bit of air in it. Very important. It's generally a nail. It, it, it's nail, a screw, it, a piece screw. of metal. Yeah. We've got we've got so many scrap iron haulers around here right now because we've got the steel mill. They, they, they haul out there and stuff falls off those trucks Absolutely. all the time. Yeah. It's it's amazing. We do a lot of brake work. We do front brake work. We do rear brake work, and and, and that's another thing. And and uh, when, when an old car starts making a, a little funny noise, if you don't know what that little funny noise is, we recommend you to come let us check that funny noise out. Let let Bruce drive it. If uh, if you know exactly when it does it and where it does it, take a ride with him and say, look, this is when it happens, this is where it happens, and point it out to him. And he's pretty quick to diagnose those noises. So if somebody is watching and, and realizing that they'd like to get their car in, and uh, uh, what do you have to do to, to get a spot, make an appointment, what do we do, call? How call does that us, work? Call us, 523-6735. Um, ask for Marty, ask for Bruce, it doesn't matter. We can get you scheduled in here and get you taken care of. All right, and I want to mention one thing before we get off here also. Uh, on the farm, tire repair. We've done that in years past, continuing to do that. Farming services yes. coming right up. That's a big yes. part of our business. Yes, they're, they're, they're turning dirt already. Um, the rain's going to slow us up a little bit this week, but uh, spring is here. Um, the, the spring planting season is, is beginning, and... It's a busy time. It's it's going to get busy. It's if we can get a little bit of dry weather, it's going to get even busier. We had a, it just rained a lot during the, during during the, the winter months and going into the spring right here. And, and uh, a lot of times, you know, people can get in the in the field in February and have everything ready to go by March first. But that hadn't been the case this year. No. So, so no. farmers are way behind. They are way behind, but they're, they're going to get after it. They're, they're yes. getting after it right yes. now. But uh, if you need our services, you need anything done to your automobile, we ask you to to uh, give us a call and uh, set up an appointment, bring the automobile in, and uh, we'll get it in, we'll get it out. 
Uh, if it needs something extra that what we, that, you know, we make a recommendation and say, well, we thought it was this, here's what it is, this is what it's going to cost to repair it, then you, you decide whether or not you want to make the repairs on that automobile. That's right. We're not going to repair anything without your knowledge. We don't do That's that. That's right. Yeah, we, we, don't, don't. we don't want surprises on your end or our end, either one. Almost 30 years in the business, 28 years in the business, Farmers Tire Mart, the Bain family, been taking care of folks like me for years and years and years, and they can take care of folks like you. Marty, good to see you. You too. With Farmers Tire Mart, Malcolm Avenue in Newport, where the rubber meets the road. For years, the battle has raged about who has more spirit, Newport Greyhound fans or the Baseball Pioneer fans. Let's see if we can go find out. I was a student trainer for the Pioneers, and I can tell you that no other team plays with as much heart and soul as they do. Go Pioneers! I've been a Greyhound football fan for over 50 years, and we all know there's magic in those orange helmets. 50 years, I didn't know we were competing on who had the oldest fans, but I thought we were talking about who had the best team, and uh, you're going to need some magic because Pioneer never quits. Give me just a second, I'm allergic to dogs, I've been sneezing all day. Hang on. Yeah, Pioneer never quits. Greyhounds have the best fans because we keep the tradition going from generation to generation. Go oh, wow. <laughs> The Pioneers have my heart, and the coaches dream of this game all year long. Yeah, they're dreaming about winning. I was a Pioneer cheerleader, and I know the Pioneer fans are always on point. As a former Greyhound lineman, I learned that Newport fans and the players always have each other's back. I'll pass on being anything other than a Greyhound. While this score may never be settled, one thing is for certain. Both have limitless enthusiasm for their teams and their towns. And at the end of the game or the work day, we are not divided by our differences, but united by our passions. Welcome to another edition of the uh, Newport Economic Development Commission uh, report with uh, Executive Director John Chadwell via Skype. You know, this is our second one, John, and uh, we're getting good at this. We at least figured out how to 
get it started and get it stopped last time. Maybe we can be as efficient this time. <laughs> yeah, we just yeah, have we a hard just... time figuring out where to look. So it looks like we're looking at the camera rather than looking down at our phone or something. But, you know, if this goes on long enough, we may be experts. Yeah, well, and, you know, when it comes out, it comes out a lot different than what we actually see on our screens. And we come out side by side. And I don't know if you're over there and I don't know if you're over <laughs> there, but I know that you're right there. So I guess if I'm looking right at my camera, we're going to be OK. But uh uh, we got some things that we want to talk about. IT Apprentice uh, School, you're talking about. Tell us some information. Give us uh, uh, give us the scoop about what's coming to Newport, Arkansas. Well, this is something we're really, really, really excited about, and we're getting started on. Uh, we've entered an agreement with the Arkansas Center for Data Sciences, um, and they'll be teaming up with the Newport Economic Development Commission and ASU Newport uh, to create a internet or information technology. Uh, apprenticeship training school in downtown Newport. Um, it's pretty interesting. They have one in uh, downtown Little Rock. They have one up in northwest Arkansas. So this will be the one in northeast Arkansas. And this is a place where you can go and get an education in uh, uh, several different areas of information technology. One is kind of just the basic coding and, and writing programs. Uh, the second area will be uh, data analysts. Um, and so people who can analyze different data patterns uh, for business. And then the third one would be cybersecurity. So you can learn how to keep companies safe uh, and keep their, their digital property safe. Um, but this isn't like a school. So, you know, in most schools you pay to go to school and then you hope at the end uh, you're going to get a job, you know, in the field that you got. Uh, many of us, like me, have a job that's not related to the field in which we went to school for. Sure. This, me too. This, yeah, this is very different. So a young person or even an older person who wants to transition their career, they can they apply um, to a position that's put on uh, the job site called Indeed.com. And it may be a data analyst position or cybersecurity. So they apply for that position and they're put into a pool of employees. At the same time, the Arkansas Center for Data Science is selling this pool of employees and their training to companies like Walmart or Tyson or somebody like that. And so then a company will call um, the Center for Data Sciences and say, OK, look, we need 10 data analysts and here's our criteria. Uh, we need them to live in this part of the state. We need them to do this. And so they'll match they'll match make. 10 people in the pool with this company and they'll wow. say, okay, we found you 10. The company will interview them and then the company actually hires the people right then. Okay. And they get paid to go to school. So wow. they're, they're an apprentice for the first, uh, for the first year and about six months of that first year, they're going to spend in school. Now, depending on which company they're working for, the, the class may be different. Uh, some companies want them to go through six months of training and then go through six months of work. Some companies want them to go through six weeks of training, six weeks at work, six weeks of training, six weeks of work. But what their goal is, is that at the end of two years, we'll have about 30 people who have been hired and are in the middle of training all the time in downtown right. Newport. And these people will be being paid a good salary to learn these skills of information technology. We're also working with several of our uh, providers to build up the infrastructure downtown and uh, list some of the office space so that when one of these big companies uh, hires 10 people and they're training here, we're going to try to convince them that they could just put a back office here. They could Absolutely. put an office, <clears throat> an office with 10 people downtown. It could be in, in a little space. And it's getting more and more important considering the circumstances we're in right now. I mean, you have a big office with 500 people in it, and all of a sudden you have something like COVID-19. That doesn't work real well, especially when yeah, not working at all. Active. But if they had offices spread out and they would have 10 in Newport and maybe 10 in Jonesboro and maybe 10 in Batesville, they were all being trained here in Newport, then they could get the same work done in, with less risk, really, to their system. So uh, we think it's got a lot of potential. We're really excited about the, the partnership with the Arkansas Center for Data Sciences. Uh, they were created out of the Governor's Blue Ribbon Commission uh, several years back, and they're part of what do you do when you take this coding initiative that the governor has put into 
uh, our K-12 system, what's the next step? Right. Well, this is the next step. Go ahead and get people hired and then get them the industry-specific training they need um, because once they get out and once they have all their training and finish, these jobs are good jobs. They, they pay eighty to $120,000 pretty much right off the bat, uh, depending on what field you're in. And a lot of the folks who go through this may decide they don't want to be hired by a company. They may decide to do it on an entrepreneurial basis. Sure. You know, they want to take this training and they want to start up their own business or start up their own company. But what it's going to bring is at any given time, there's going to be 30, 30 jobs in downtown Newport paying a good salary for people to go to school uh, and building our economy. Uh, and so we're really excited about this. We're really excited that we're the training hub for Northeast Arkansas. Yeah. And uh, you'll hear a lot more about it. What we're going to do now is since we have this as our hub, in the downtown, it's the kind of the center center part. Um, we're going to start working with infrastructure needs and turn downtown Newport into um, our downtown technology park. And there we're going to start go. marketing it to companies and say, "Hey, come here, get an office, train your employees, and you'll be ready to go." We've got high speed internet. We've got the capacity you need, and so uh, I think really um, this is kind of the industry of the future. And this is going to really help us. I, I was watching TV the other day, and, and they were advertising a, a, a faucet on a sink. And you, it was connected to the Internet. So you could tell the <laughs> faucet on the sink, fill the cup with 32 ounces of water, and it would fill the cup with exactly 32 ounces of water. And if you notice, our homes are getting more and more like that. Sure they are. People's refrigerators are now connected to create a grocery list, our thermostats our garage doors, our lights. <clears throat> well, there have got to be people who, A, do all the programming for that, B, analyze the data to see what's working and what's not and where you want to market and where you want to streamline. And then really the last part, there have got to be people who keep us safe with all of this stuff in our house being connected to the Internet so that the wrong people don't get in there and unlock our doors at the wrong time or, <laughs> or something like that. And so the demand for these jobs is just, it's, it's increasing phenomenally. And the governor really wants Arkansas to be on the map as a place for companies to come for information technology. And the best way to do that is to create a workforce. Well, the best way for Newport to get some of these, um, sorry, I got a call beeping in. Uh, to get some of these uh, jobs here is to provide the training and provide the workforce so that we can um, we can be known as the place that has both the human infrastructure and the physical infrastructure uh, for these new kind of jobs. A couple of things. I uh, want to ask you, I want to make a comment, and then I got one final question. The vision that we have in Newport, Arkansas, is, is a tremendous vision that is second to none of taking what we have and say, look, we have some assets. It might not be what you think it is, but if you have a good enough vision to say, we can take this, what you might think is not real good, and we can turn this into something that is as astronomically new and getting into the technology business. And this is one of those great opportunities for us as a community in Newport, Arkansas, to do big things with downtown Newport. It is. And I, and I want to, another thing I need to mention, a lot of people say, well, why are y'all going, why do y'all go out of town to meetings? Or why do you teach at the Community Development Institute? Or why do you do these things on the outside? Well, the only reason we really had this opportunity is that the governor's office was looking for a place for this to happen. Sure. Um, and Amy Whitehead, who is was over Community Development Institute, where I've taught for several years, know her very well. That she got a call and she they said, "What was what's a good community that would be you know interested in this?" And and we were one of the ones she recommended. And so we get we get a call and and um, as as we're working on it, it's those connections that you build that give you the opportunity. It didn't necessarily you know, make it happen for us more than anybody else, but it gave us the opportunity to get in the conversation. And and you've got to have those connections. You've got to have people who know what your assets are and know what your stuff is and know what other people's uh, needs are and that, that help match and that help say, hey, here's one of the places that that might work. Um, and 
that that really is invaluable for us. All of the folks around the state who know the assets that Newport has and what Newport's trying to do and are willing to be partners with us to help us when opportunity comes along. Well, and again, tell us, uh, for those of us who might be interested in getting more information on, on the IT program, what do we have to do? Well, right now there's some jobs being advertised on Indeed.com for data analyst uh, with the Arkansas Center for Data Science. And you can go there and you can look up those jobs. Um, if you're interested, you can apply for it or share it with people you think might be interested. And then uh, as, as we begin to refine it and brand it and roll it out, you're going to see a whole lot more information about it. And uh, we're going to be pretty uh, aggressive at trying to market this. Uh, the big need will be creating this pipeline of people who want to be interested. So if you know anybody who has been interested in getting into information technology, computer type jobs, please have them, have them contact us uh, at our office and we'll steer them in the right direction. I know that is good stuff, John Chadwell. And as always, it's my pleasure to get to visit with you. And I, I'll certainly, uh, I'll certainly be glad when we can really sit down and, you know, on the couch and talk side by side because I miss seeing people and I know I know you do as well. But uh, it's great stuff for NEDC in Newport, Arkansas. Thank you, my friend. Hi, you're welcome. Thank you. John Chadwell, Newport Economic Development Commission. He's the executive director and we meet each and every month to talk about great things going on in Newport, Arkansas. I invented probe works about three years ago and now it's come to the forefront because of the crisis that we have here in this country and all over the world. Uh, with the board, you can take it anywhere. You can get outside and get away from people. You can do all the training that you need. Any exercise, any place, any time, you can knock it out. You have black bands, red bands, yellow bands. You have handles, straight bar, sliders, door attachment. You can do any exercise that you can put your mind to and get creative with. So we're really excited to bring this thing to everybody in the world. Customized Vision Care in the Newport Village Mall. I'm David Black, and this is my good friend, Dr. Gavin McDowell. Good to see good you, Good to see sir. you, too, my friend. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Boy, isn't that me? <laughs> isn't that me? Well, that's, that's the uh, physical precautions, the PPE that we have to utilize just to shake hands these days. We have been it's asked scary. to do a lot of PPEs and, and wearing masks and social distancing and doing lots of other things. and. And uh, we've been doing the proper care here at Customized Vision Care. Doing everything above and beyond what's required, I'll put it that way. We, we're required to have special masks and, and use gloves during certain things that we do with patients. Of course, we had st strict uh, sanitation protocols before this all started. Now, basically, we just had to double everything sure. we've done uh, and sometimes triple. But, I mean, yeah, we've... Thankfully, our world has not changed a whole bunch. Right, absolutely. So. Absolutely. Uh, when you talk about changing, I mean, people's eyes and, and eye problems, I mean, those continue to exist. Yeah, they, they didn't stop. <laughs> they didn't stop. Me. Even whenever, you know, for, for a good two months, we were effectively shut down by the CDC doing nothing but emergency care and urgent care. And basically, it was like we our last uh, visit we had. My job was to keep people out of the emergency room and out absolutely. of their, their people. PCP's office, so that time's finally passed. We're actually able to get back to doing what we're doing and, and addressing, I can't tell you, <laughs> it was so odd that during that time when we were only supposed to be doing urgent care, the number of patients who come in or call in wanting to have vision exams done. Absolutely. And, you know, that's primarily what we do. Uh, and I had to tell them no. It's so odd that, you know, what you do, you can't do. Yeah, I can't do. <laughs> uh, it was it was frustrating, and, I, it, and you know, it was it was so easy as someone who uh, we were effectively shut down uh, for two months to be spiteful against other industries that could be like uh, the hardware stores and stuff like sure. that. But realistically, I mean, it was nothing more than I just wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be. I wanted to be. You know serving my patients and such and actually working for a change instead of doing all the honeydew jobs around the house that exists. <laughs> I never knew there were that many. 
Well, if you really look at what happened and what is continuing to happen and the, the, the growth as we, quote, open up in the phases, you look at when you went, there were some stores that you could go to that were pretty crowded. <laughs> Very <laughs> and, and crowded. And didn't have masks and didn't have a, a Oh, you can still find that today. Or, That's the scary thing. You can still find it today. So how, how, do, how does somebody draw the line on it? Where, where do we get, where do we get, you can't, and you can, and what's essentially, what's it not, not I mean, that, that's, that's some political stuff. And it, well, know. here's about the most middle of the road way I can make it. If you don't mind a catching it mm -hmm. or be spreading it, do as you wish, right. but don't blame anybody else whenever you catch it or spread it. There you go. That's, there you go. It's kind of, uh, you make your own decision. Yeah, yeah. You decide what you want to do. I, I myself, I, I will be responsible for myself and my staff and my, my family. I want to I want to wear a mask when I'm out all the time. I will use gloves when it's appropriate to use gloves. And by the way, all y'all wearing gloves to Walmart and all that, your gloves are dirty now. So you're serving no purpose other than just dirtying the gloves. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, you make a good example about the, right. this glove. We shake hands. After we shake hands with the glove, the glove no the longer glove serves a purpose. Dirty. It's not like I can <laughs> shake your hand and touch that doorknob and wipe the floor and go yeah. clean a toilet and my glove's still clean. That's right. Uh, then they didn't work like they're not magic gloves. <laughs> So. Oh, it's been a different, it's been a different world. But the good news is that we're back to seeing patients. Yes, and yes, we are back happens. to routine care. And like I said, thankfully, with the new, uh, what's the expected protocols that, w that go above what our normal protocols were, didn't change what we did much at all. In, uh, you know, anyway. So new things are the masks. You know, uh, it was it's kind of funny. I had a patient come in today. Uh, and, and, and just a name about town. I mean, someone who has a recognizable name. And I said, you know, it's finally nice to put half of a face with the name. And, <laughs> but, you know, realistically, we have masks that we have to wear full time now. Uh, our cleaning protocols are, like I said, a, a little bit more than they were. I, maybe we were over cleaning before. I don't know. Uh, but I felt safe with what we were doing. Uh, but now we're just going a little bit above and beyond that now. So our world really hasn't changed. So, yeah, I mean, we effectively can do anything that we used to do before this whole craziness began, so. I do want to ask you this, because I respect your opinion. Oh, really? Guy, I saw a guy on television. <laughs> yeah, a little, I'm surprised, too. A little. <laughs> I can edit this out, you know, if I don't like it. <laughs> Somebody asked the question to a gentleman the other night. He said, when do we get back to the normal? And he said, we'll never have the normal that we used to have. Yeah, yeah. And I go, w w w well, sure we will. Won't we? Well, we'll get. Well, it, it's my opinion, okay. and, and you know, opinions are what what they're worth. Um, we'll get close. Okay. Uh, once a vaccine and a reliable treatment come through, but the problem with viruses is that they just like with the flu vaccine. Sure. You get a flu vaccine yearly, and that's for most strains of flu. So there may be new strains of this coronavirus come out that that affect us in different ways right. that the treatments we are studying and, and researching now may prove to be very effective that down the down the road may not so you know, I think really the, the biggest thing is, is no one no one knows and that's the biggest problem that everybody has the uncertainty of everything right. not knowing Absolutely. when some semblance of normalcy is coming about, uh, about again uh, or whatnot but you know it's it's I think we can get close to normal but yeah, I think there's going to be a, a long-term uh, life hangover changes. From I mean, this. lots there's lots of things that we have to adapt to as we go, and, and uh, going back to normal in a in a landline telephone without a cell phone, and then all of a sudden we have a cell phone, and that you know will we ever get back to normal? No, we're not going to get back to having landlines yeah. as our number one way of communication on a cell on a, on a device. Exactly. That's exactly. A phone. So anyway, but uh, you know, from a healthcare standpoint, it's 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 not unfortunate for anybody to have to go through this, but it's around the world and in. Uh, I think the United States has, has, has done very, very well, and certainly Arkansas has done tremendously well, and then in Jackson County has been more than exceptional. Yes, been, yes. Been more. I, I do want to say this, and I've touched my mask, mask about 30 seconds. Consistently, I've, I've no, yes. yeah, yeah. And that's not good. No, that, it's that, not. That, that's not good to it's take not. your hands, and, and, but anyway. So basically, I mean, but you have to understand, though, masks are supposed to be almost like the gloves, almost, in the sense that once they're worn, 
they're considered dirty from then on sure. out. So if you go to touching it, just realize you're you're now contaminated the outside of your mask as well as your hand. And then it's all this just being conscious of your hands and what they're doing all the time. I never knew how much I loved to touch my face before this whole thing happened, but it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, the most important thing is that we're 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 back seeing patients. Yes, That's back seeing patients. Uh, you have vision and or and or eye health concerns and needs, please give us a call. Happy uh, to get you right in here. Eight seven zero five two three and a bunch of threes after that. But I will say this. Some of the protocols have changed. If you're going to come in, we can't really do walk-in. So give us a call when you get here. We'll we'll, we'll direct you in. That's yeah, and, and and we got our temperature taken, and yep. and, and yep. got some sanit sanitary uh, stuff for our hands, and, and that's part of the quote. There, go on the mask. I'm going to take you out for a lie bath right after we're done with this. <laughs> do I have to do one? Well, well, sir, it's my pleasure to get to see you again. You as well, as always. And oh, <laughs> got to got to prepare for the handshake. <laughs> yes, sir. As always to come to customized vision care <laughs> and to get all the care that anybody could possibly need. <laughs> Throw it away. There you go. He's Dr. Gavin McDowell. I'm not. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. For years, the battle has raged about who has more spirit, Newport Greyhound fans or the Baseball Pioneer fans. Let's see if we can go find out. I was a student trainer for the Pioneers, and I can tell you that no other team plays with as much heart and soul as they do. Go Pioneers! I've been a Greyhound football fan for over 50 years, and we all know there's magic in those orange helmets. 50 years, I didn't know we were competing on who had the oldest fans. I thought we were talking about who had the best team. And uh, you're going to need some magic, because Pioneer never quits. Give me just a second, I'm allergic to dogs. I've been sneezing all day. Yeah, Pioneer never quits. Greyhounds have the best fans because we keep the tradition going from generation to generation. Go oh, wow. <laughs> The Pioneers have my heart and the coaches dream of this game all year long. Yeah, they're dreaming about winning. I was a Pioneer cheerleader and I know the Pioneer fans are always on point. As a former Greyhound lineman, I learned that Newport fans and the players always have each other's back. I'll pass on being anything other than a Greyhound. While this score may never be settled, one thing is for certain. Both have limitless enthusiasm for their teams and their towns. And at the end of the game or the workday, we are not divided by our differences, but united by our passions. Hello everybody and welcome to the May edition of the Farmer Supply Association Agriculture Report. I'm Randy Klopetschka, agronomist with Farmer Supply Association. Well, we're taping on May 11th and I really need my coat on out here. It's pretty cold out here and kind of unseasonably cool for May 11th and May 12th. Tomorrow's supposed to be even colder with rain, so we're kind of dealing with some unusual weather, but what's new about that? That's kind of the norm anymore is dealing with unusual weather. So. Uh, we're in the midst of another one to two day planting run. That kind of seems to be the story for 2000, the spring of 2020. You know, we get gotten a lot of rain and we'll get maybe a day or two where farmers are busy trying to get everything done. You know, our store and everybody else's store will be the same way. People wanting stuff done that day and you just can't get to everybody because it's just, there's so much having to be done on one day. So we're, we're doing the best we can. Uh, we are. I think certainly ahead of last year where we're at this time. So, you know, planting progress is really pretty good, uh, especially again compared to last year. I mean, we'd like to be done with rice, but we're not. But we, we, again, we've got better progress than last year. So, you know, I think we're okay there and we, we're keep getting these little dry spells and hopefully we can get pretty much all that acreage planted that we intend to plant by the, by the end of May. Cause you know, our yields will certainly usually hold up pretty good, especially with the hybrids all the way to toward the end of May. So anyway, hopefully we can get all that done. Uh, the stands of rice this year, as you can see in this field behind me, uh, mostly really good stands of rice this year. And last week I was in a, in, in fields just, you know, kind of just thinking about how good our stands are this year. And then I finally got in a field that was some really tight dirt, the kind that'll break your pocket knife. And, you know, I had some weak stands in that one field and, and rice trying to come up and hopefully it's made it by then with the rain we got over the weekend. But uh, overall, really good stands. 
want to focus mainly on weed control and finish up with a little bit on fertilize. Our residual activities, uh, our res residual activity from our residual herbicides has been, been pretty good this year and we've gotten the range to keep it activated. You know, my rule of thumb is always, you know, if you're going with those label rates of uh, your residual herbicides like Command and, and such, well, I like to get about 21 days out of your, uh, out of the activity of a, of a labeled application. Uh, you want to get something overlapped before that 21 days is up, and you usually want to push it a little more than that, but you want to get something out there before that first uh, residual herbicide uh, gives out and, and runs out so you don't get any uh, grass coming up between that time. But again, about my rule of thumb, kind of you want to get 21 days. So if you want to, you think you can get 21 days, you want to get a residual overlap there probably around 14 or so, or even before that, just depending on what the forecast looks like for rain. Uh, get another residual herbicide out there and keep that residual layer active so you don't get any grass emergence out there. Several options are available. You know, some more command. I mean, most people are going to put command in their first shot. That's pretty normal. You, you can use up to 34 ounces of command. Now, obviously, uh, you know, cut ground, some real sandy ground, you're not going to push those, those uh, totals to be that much. But, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, mixed to heavier ground, certainly you can go 34 ounces total in multiple applications for the season. So uh, that's a possibility is to overlap with more command. Uh, we talked about some uh, premixes that are available with command in them that you can use too. Obey is faster than command. That's a good premix to use. Rice One is command and prowl. That's a good premix to use. And then you've got, you, of course, you got your prowl, valero, and facet individually. Any kind of combination of any of these is fine. Just get something out there and get it activated. And if you'll do that, you should have pretty good grass control. <clears throat> Generally, what, I, what we're seeing out there this year is good grass control for the most part, uh, especially you know, with that first application with the rains we've had, and again, hopefully you've got something overlapped out there before that first one ran out, and, and we'll keep getting that good grass control. Once you start do, once you start getting escapes out there, if your, uh, you know, your pre pre emerge, your residuals uh, play out, is you want to get the, you're going to have to start thinking about some post emerge uh, grass control out there once they play out and you have some escapes. So if you get to that point, hopefully your pre emerge will hold out and you won't have to worry about that. But if you do have escapes out there, uh, then we've got several options. Uh, my first go to is generally Rice Star, uh, the full label rate of 24 ounces of Rice Star. The good thing about rice star, it's good on about all of our kinds of grasses, barnyard, sprinkle top, signal grass, all of them. So that's a good thing about rice star. That's kind of my go-to. You really like good moisture uh, for rice star, preferably muddy for it to work well. Some other options out there include regiment. Uh, it's strictly a barnyard grass as far as grasses go. Uh, and you need four leaf rice before you put regiment out there. So that's one I use quite a bit if barnyard grass is my only grass out there. Facet especially if broadleaf signal grass is your main weed out there. I love to watch uh, uh, facet work on broadleaf signal grass. It's very active on broadleaf signal grass. So that's kind of my go-to with broadleaf signal grass a lot of times. Uh, propanil still has a place. You know, we've got a lot of propanil resistant barnyard grass out there. Uh, I sent 10 samples off last fall and five of them were resistant to propanil. I figured it would be more than that, but five of them were. So. And we got to watch that, but it still has activity on some of the other grasses. So, uh, you know, propanil, rice bowl is a good choice right there. Rice bowl is a premix of uh, propanil and bolero, so rice bowl is a real good option there that has propanil in it. And then, of course, uh, with your Clearfield rice, a new path and clear path, which is a premix of facet and new path. And then for our full page rices, we have preface, which is the same thing really as new path, but preface is what you must use if you have full page of rices. So that's some of your options for grasses. Besides grasses, the things I'm really seeing right now where the, where the residuals are working well, what I'm seeing is sedges uh, starting to come on and also some black seeded weeds come on. So I want to talk about your options with them. Of course, with uh, nut sedge or uh, our hallow sulfuron is still working well, and that's either Permit Plus or Gambit. You know, I get a lot of questions about, you know, comparing Gambit and Permit Plus. They both, uh, one ounce of Gambit and three quarter ounce of Permit Plus, both have the same amount of hallow sulfuron in it, so the same kind of killing ability for the yellow nut sedges in either of those. In fact, they're both made by the same company, so either one of them will be fine for the yellow nut sedge. The difference uh, comes with your broadleaf control. 
Gambit has a little bit better activity on you know, probably a handful of broad leaves. It's not way better, but it's a little better on three or four broad leaves. And it gives you a little bit of residual on broad leaves. So uh, that's something that, uh, that might pay off for, for you in the long run. And, you, and also it's usually a few cents cheaper as well. So I kind of lean on Gambit uh, for these applications for yellow nut sedge, especially if there's some broad leaves out in that uh, field as well. Talked last year about uh, the flat sedges and the problem they're becoming because they're, AL, they're resistant to the ALS herbicides. So if you have flat sedge, hope you have bad flat sedge that you put some sharpen out there. It has good pre-activity on, uh, on our flat sedges and hopefully you put that out there in those bad fields and it's helped you a lot on keeping that population down. Some other options, once you have emerged flat sedges, uh, rice bow, again that pre-mix of propanil and bolero, uh, propanil plus basagran is a good choice for the flat sedges, and also loyant, which we had you know, a lot of bad results and uh, bad views on loyant a couple of years ago, but it's got some good fits and certainly flat sedges is one of them and pigweeds is one of them, so you might want to consider loyant if you have some flat sedge out in your field you need to take care of. So that's kind of how you take care of the sedges. As far as the black seeds, you know, I think if you've got some facet in your mix somewhere, that's going to help you with the black seeds. We're talking about coffee bean, indigo, and morning glory. So facet's going to help you a lot on those. Uh, you know, if you get emergence and later on, uh, propanil grandstand uh, is a real good choice on the black seeds. There's several different uh, propanil combinations out there that'll help on the black seeds. Also sharpens very good on the black seeds as well. So you've got several opportunities and usually a little extra time to take care of those black seeds uh, before they get away from you and become too much of a problem. So that's where we're at uh, with the uh, weed control. You know, by the time May is over with, this earlier rice is going to be ready for some pre-flood nitrogen. Uh, I ran some DD50s uh, with our various rice varieties uh, just a couple of days ago, and it's showing that uh, these uh, varieties that came, this rice that came up around the 30th of uh, May, uh, April, 1st of May, those two days in there, and that's when some of that early rice, a lot of it was coming up. So if your rice came up uh, during that period, you know, April 30th to around May 1st, then uh, it shows the optimum stage for pre-flood nitrogen going to be about the last 10 days of May, and we might need to push that forward a little bit with this cold weather we're dealing with right now, but generally around those last 10 days of May, maybe the first day or two of June, is going to be when we need to be thinking about getting that pre-flood nitrogen on them. Uh, that's the optimum window. Now even more important than that is that last day, and we talked about this year, the last year, the last day that you can get fertilizer out there and get it activated without losing yield. I think that's a very important date. I know a lot of people don't mess with DD50 anymore, but I think that one date on there is the most important date on there and something you need to be thinking about. And it varies quite a bit by variety. Uh, again, looking at April 30th emergence, um, Clearfield 151 and Rice Tech 753, the last date to get your nitrogen activated on those two varieties without starting to lose yield is the 2nd of June. Uh, 153 is right with uh, those two on the 3rd of June. Uh, full page uh, 7321, the 4th of June. So you can see those, those um, Clearfield varieties like 151, 153, and then your Rice Tech 753 and its full page equivalent, the 7321. You really going to have to get that nitrogen out there pretty quick on those. On the other side, we've got some varieties that you can wait and not lose much yield. So uh, those include uh, Diamond, Titan, uh, Clearfield M04, so the three medium grains there, and also um, uh, Jupiter. Again, that, so we've got three medium grains and Diamond right there where you've got a little more time to play with. If it's a little bit wet, you know, you don't have to be pushing it. You can wait till it dries out and not lose any, uh, any yield potential. So I kind of keep that in mind. And another, again, another good reason to run DD50. Finally on nitrogen, uh, you know, the university has average, average uh, fertilizer rates for the different varieties. And, you know, I think they're good to go by, but there may be some places we can push these a little bit and, and, and get our yield potential up there a little bit. So be thinking about maybe some maybe trying some of this, especially on varieties that don't lodge, you know, that stand real well on ground where you know that, uh, you, you know, that you can stand a little more nitrogen without losing, uh, losing that uh, lodging, you know, resistance and things like that. And also varieties that are not bad for sheath blight and other diseases. So, you know, if you haven't tried any of this, might want to try pushing some uh, nitrogen rates just a little bit and see how it works for you on these certain varieties in certain fields. So, 
again, a lot of stuff to talk about this month with things going on in May, and uh, hopefully uh, things will be shaping up and we can talk more about what's going on uh, in our June program. This has been Randy Kopechka with the May edition of the Farmer's Supply Association Agriculture Report. I invented ProBoards about three years ago and now it's come to the forefront because of the crisis that we have here in this country and all over the world. Uh, with the board you can take it anywhere, you can get outside, you can get away from people, you can do all the training that you need. Any exercise, any place, any time you can knock it out. You have black bands, red bands, yellow bands, you have handles, straight bar, sliders, door attachment. You can do any exercise that you can put your mind to and get creative with. So we're really excited to bring this thing to everybody in the world. Unity Health Harris Medical Center in Newport visiting with Melanie McCarty about behavioral health and uh, uh, certainly important at this time with the pandemic uh, going on throughout the United States. But uh, welcome back to the program and tell us a little bit about behavioral health. Behavioral health is that is what we use to encompass everything from uh, situational things like uh, you're dealing with grief, you're having depression related to that or anxiety related to a new job or starting new school. Um, or, you know, even along the lines of someone who lives with a chronic psychological disease such as bipolar or schizophrenia. So the term behavioral health is all-encompassing from whether it's chronic or situational. Well, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today that's so important when, we're, when you're in a pandemic and you're in a, a, a physical health change, people are getting sick physically, <laughs> And then there are some things that trigger some behavioral problems that are uh, completely different from, I mean, behavioral problems can lead to physical sickness. Yes, and <laughs> vice versa. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we have lots of evidence to support that people who live with chronic pain are at higher risk for depress depression, uh, anxiety. So really want to stress right now, Unity, we're here with you. Uh, we're all going through this hard time together. Uh, with everything going on with COVID-19, we're living in some unprecedented times. And on, in all honesty, it's a traumatic situation. Every time we turn on the TV, we're seeing something horrific, even though it's several states away. Here in Arkansas, we're very fortunate that we haven't had to deal with that at the same level. Sure. But the uncertainty is hard for all of us. So. What we want to do is just remind the community that we do have resources. Uh, we have put together a hotline. It's available Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and it's for the community. It's for associates, uh, people working, th those essential workers, uh, you know, the folks who are keeping the grocery stores open, the folks who are keeping those trucks on the road. Um, you can call that. It's 501-380-CARE, um, and that is for people who are dealing with depression, anxiety, fear, related to the outcome of COVID-19. When you're in a, a, a home setting, which is kind of different now, you've got kids that are not in school, you've got uh, parents that are not at work, and you have uh, parents seeing children more than they, they would normally see them, and, and maybe having caretakers, you know, taking care of, of, of our, our uh, uh, most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. What are some of the signs that, that we might look for that might, might trigger us to think, well, there may be a problem here that I need to call? So that is, that, that is a good point. We do see a lot of people who maybe were taking care, acting as caretaker towards their elderly loved one. Um, things that you may be seeing now that maybe you weren't seeing as much of is, you know, forgetting new or recent information. Um, if you have a loved one that asks the same question over and over, uh, frequently repeats themselves because they're not remembering what was said five or ten minutes ago, that's a good sign. Um, some of the uh, difficulty doing familiar tasks, uh, that's usually a big warning sign. You know, for instance, uh, a good example, grandma always made this 
fantastic lasagna you look forward to going to grandma's okay. every su sunday now you're seeing grandma's forgetting to she didn't put the noodles in and last sunday she forgot to add the right. cheese just those simple tasks that were part of their routine they're forgetting those small details um getting confused about place and time i think we all do that to some degree but sure. when it becomes a cro chronic consistent problem that's going to be a warning sign um, you see worse judgment, impulsive behavior, things that are uncharacteristic, you know, um, changes in personality. Say before, maybe your mother or your, you know, your elder uh, was just real sweet, calm, and now they're just snapping at you and seeming to do things just to irritate you, that they've had that change in their personality. That is, that's a warning sign. So with those signs, um, the first thing you would want to do is contact we our outpatient provider here, sure. and that's our Clarity uh, Health and Wellness Clinic. Mm -hmm. And in response to the COVID uh, epidemic, what we've done is now you can, we have access to a lot more telehealth. So at this point in time, you can actually contact your provider and talk to a professional without ever leaving your home. Okay. So that's an option. Um, if you have access to a smartphone, to a laptop, you can use the telehealth uh, options. And then of course, if you're the caretaker, there's some things that you need to do to be taking care of yourself because unfortunately that cognitive memory impairment, that disease affects everyone differently. Everyone's journey is a little bit different and it's often the caretaker who has to adjust. Just, just some basic things that you want to remember as you're dealing with your loved one at home is don't ever argue with them. Whether or right. not their point of view is based in fact, that's their reality. So arguing will often lead to more agitation or anxiety. Um, try to understand that their ability for logic and reason is diminishing. Mm -hmm. um, and also remember to try not to take things personally. You know, again, we mentioned the change in behavior, maybe doing some things, acting aggressively, kind of out lashing out at family. That's not about you. That's the disease that's making your loved one act that way. And the best thing that a person can do is just become educated about the disease process. Um, what you're going to be dealing with, what type of medications are available. You'll want to work with that outpatient provider to help stabilize your loved one. And the education will help you down the road when it's time for to make some harder decisions. The hotline, the hotline number, who can use it? I mean, anybody, anybody. That's, that's for anybody. That's anybody, for anybody can anybody. use that number. Mm -hmm. And we'll just call and there'll be somebody on the other end that will answer questions yes. for us and then maybe lead us to where we need to go or what we need to do at that stage. So we have the hotline staffed with uh, licensed therapists. Okay. So when you call, cool. you'll speak to a licensed therapist okay. who will, will kind of walk you through. And then if you need more resources, they'll get you connected to those resources. That's awesome. That is awesome. When you see the number at the bottom of the screen, and we've had it on the bottom of the screen since the beginning of the interview, but uh, that's the number that you do call. And Melanie, I know that uh, uh, this is right down your alley when you talk about behavioral health. You've done this for a long, long time, and we appreciate your expertise. No, thank you. Melanie McCarthy at uh, Unity Health Harris Medical Center in Newport. For years, the battle has raged about who has more spirit, Newport Greyhound fans or the Baseball Pioneer fans. Let's see if we can go find out. I was a student trainer for the Pioneers, and I can tell you that no other team plays with as much heart and soul as they do. Go Pioneers! I've been a Greyhound football fan for over 50 years, and we all know there's magic in those orange helmets. 50 years, I didn't know we were competing on who had the oldest fans. I uh, thought we were talking about who had the best team. And uh, you're going to need some magic because Pioneer never quits. Give me just a second, I'm allergic to dogs. I've been sneezing all day. Damn. Yeah, Pioneer never quits. Greyhounds have the best fans because we keep the tradition going from generation to generation. Go oh, Hounds! <laughs> the Pioneers have my heart and the coaches dream of this game all year long. Yeah, they're dreaming about winning. I was a Pioneer cheerleader and I know the Pioneer fans are always on point. As a former Greyhound lineman, I learned that Newport fans and the players always have each other's back. I'll pass on being anything other than a Greyhound. While this score may never be settled, one thing is for certain, 
Both have limitless enthusiasm for their teams and their towns. And at the end of the game or the workday, we are not divided by our differences, but united by our passions. St. Michael's Place, Pecan Street in Newport, and uh, as like last month, we're not at St. Michael's. We're here in our office at Cable 15 TV, and uh, we have a special guest. Of course, you know Jay Cox. Everybody knows Jay Cox. Jay, introduce us to the uh, lady in the middle here. Well, it's good to be here, David. We are uh, at your office, like you said. We're still honoring the social distancing guidelines, except we're not quite six foot apart. We're but, close. Uh, we're close. But we're we're doing the best we can. That's right. You know, and, Small uh, room we're in. But uh, we are uh, uh, here today with uh, someone uh, not new to St. Michael's. Uh, she's actually been on film with us before, and uh, but she is uh, graduating to a new position. Oh, good girl. Stepping good. up Stepping in the world. Up. This is Stepping Rhiannon Comer. And she is our new director of nursing. We call her the D-O-N for short, and that's what most people commonly call it. But uh, director of nursing, Rhiannon Comer. And she's no uh, stranger to long-term care, and she has uh, quite a few uh, accomplishments in the nursing world. And I'm not going to begin to try to name all of her certifications. As she's been in nursing a long time. But uh, we want to welcome uh, Rhiannon Comer to her new position is Director of Nursing. Well, congratulations, and I know it's always a, a challenge, but it's also rewarding when you get the responsibility of something new and upgraded, but kind of tell us, uh, first of all, remind folks a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about you, and then we'll get into talking about the Director of Nursing part. Okay, well, my name's Rhiannon Comer. I'm from Missouri. I know I had to be boxed and shipped in, but <laughs> um, I've been uh, in healthcare my whole life. I worked on an ambulance for 10 years. LPN, RN, I'm a nationally certified med surge nurse, nationally certified charge nurse, um, oncology, orthopedics, I've done ER cardiology. Uh, about the only thing I don't do is birth babies. <laughs> and if you had to, I bet you could. I don't want to. <laughs> That's wanna. why I work in long-term care. We don't run into that very often. <laughs> Director of nursing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the position. Let's talk a little bit about what you do. You know, we'll talk day to day, month to month, year to year. What does what does the director of nursing have to do besides direct the nurses? <laughs> We make sure that the residents all receive the care that they need for everything, not just their body, but their spirit, their soul, their mind, what all's going on with them from day to day, and let the residents know that we're there. You know, if they are something going on with them, you know, especially right now with this COVID going on, we're doing a lot of emotional support nursing. Um, been able to keep everybody healthy, blessed to keep everyone safe, just dealing with them not seeing their families and keeping them, um, as you get older, you know, you don't eat as much, you don't drink as much, you lose your sense of smell, so you don't want as much nutrition. So, you know, keeping it fun, keeping it happy in the house, reminding them to eat, reminding, you know, getting people out and doing stuff with a six foot distance, but still keeping them engaged in life. Well, it's different. I mean, it, it, it's different that, that the, uh, you know, family's not there. Mm -hmm family's not there, so the nursing side of it has to become a little bit more, even more family oriented than it's ever been before because that's the only family these, these folks mm -hmm. are getting to see. How, how does that, how does it kind of work? I mean, especially your job with having to train and teach and, and, and obviously you have a great staff to work with. Well, Jay and I have both said many times that this is a worker heart. You know, yeah. if, if your heart's not in long-term care, then you don't need to be. Um, we all take time. I talk to my nurses and my CNAs and remind them that these folks are only seeing us now. You know, we have some people whose family would come spend two, three hours with them a day and now they're just seeing us. So, you know, you take that time, what used to be, you know, a 30 minute med pass is now going to take you half the morning while right. you're still meeting your parameters because you got to stop and talk to them and, you know, find out what's going on with them and just really, you know, be there for them. So it, to, to me, it seems like it would make the job a lot more difficult from a nursing standpoint to have to do those extra <coughs> things. But those are the things that you have to do beyond the call of duty in a time when, when things aren't just real normal. And, and it's not real normal for, for anybody in America, but especially right. at, at a nursing home. And, you know, my, I'm blessed with great nurses, but that's their every day. I mean, they'll stop and talk to these residents, but it's the ones that we're getting to the point now 
that people are really starting to regress. We've got a tougher and a pine knot generation that's helping us. Right, I mean, they've right, been through yeah. it all. They, <clears throat> they've done it. But we're getting into third month, second month, third yeah, month, third. and we're really starting to feel it and really starting to see it. Well, I can, I can see a lot of change or feel. I know that there will be a lot of change. Of course, you know, I haven't been in there because I'm not allowed in there. But uh, Jay, I mean, changes, and, and, and Rhiannon talks about, I mean, there's some difficulty in trying to do what you do, but there's no doubt we are doing it at a standard that's second to none. Well, at St. Michael's Place, you know, obviously, um, in not just St. Michael's, but any nursing home, this field is one of the most highly regulated industries that's out there. And, yeah. and one of the big uh, talks uh, among healthcare is that long term care is one of the uh, second most highly in, uh, in the industry next to even a nuclear power plant. Wow. You know, that's, that's, that's the talk in the trainings that we get. And uh, so when you take that much regulation, uh, then you add on all of this that's coming down now because we're all going through something we've never been through before. So you add that much more regulation. Um, this is brand new uh, training, you know, for us, for leadership. That's brand new training for the nurses, the CNAs, uh, the kitchen staff. I mean, everything that we've always done, we've had to improvise. So, you know, we've had to learn it as we go, but we've had to to uh, implement new um, ways of doing things almost overnight. Right. And so, and there were times that every day as we, uh, as we listened to the governor, comes on at 1.30 every day and, mm -hmm. and the CDC would, there were days that new regulations were changing every day. Right. So as, as soon as we would, you know, send out the word, this is what we have to do, Gotta it's almost change. like the next day, <laughs> you know, as the numbers were changing in the state, you know, now, uh, the numbers are going down. Right. You know, it's like we've reached our peak in Arkansas and things are going down. But as the numbers were climbing there for a little bit, it's like the regulation was changing almost daily. And because obviously in, in long-term care, the, the elders are the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And sure. so our regulations were even tougher, it seemed like. And so, uh, you know, we were having to make changes. So putting a lot of extra stress on the staff, putting a lot of extra stress on the residents. and and some of them, you know, with their disease process, they just don't understand. Mm -hmm. So trying, you know, not just implementing these changes, but also trying to help them understand. Sure. Is, sure. And it, you know, being trained as a nurse, being trained as a CNA, being trained, you know, in the kitchen or whatever your, you know, whatever your job is in the building, if you're on staff in our building, when a resident asks you a question, your job is to stop and see to that resident. Right. Yeah, you know, I may right. not be a nurse, but right. if a resident tells me I'm hurting, sure. My job right then is to stop and and see to that need. Now I may, you know, that may be out of my field of expertise, but at that moment, my job is to to see to that resident. So whether it's to go get help, or answer that question, or or deal with that need, and so uh, you know, when we're dealing with a whole new ballpark of issues and, and, and things going on, you know, everyone has had to adapt to the changes that's going on. So, you know, part of Rhiannon's job, you know, part of my job as being in leadership is, is trying to help uh, our staff be able to adapt, also to be able to, to pass that knowledge down to the residents in a way that they can understand, you know, on top of that, they're wondering why how come my family's not coming? Right, uh, absolutely. And so we we're trying to do our best to to uh, keep them occupied and keep them busy and, and come up with new activities that will allow them to stay six foot apart and mm -hmm. and even uh, uh, you know spaced out as much as they can. So it, it's been a challenge, but well, you know, a, a challenge way. that I think that as many times as I've been in that building and what I have seen over the years that, that I have been in there every month that our staff has continually to you know have gotten better and better and better and you see that with the residents mm -hmm. you see, you know I see that as a, you know I'm an outsider I don't have anybody out there I'm there once a month and then what I see in that one time a month has always been top-notch care 
and and taking care of the residents. And I, I don't know that anybody does it any better than you guys. I mean, uh, just it, 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 it's that. awesome what you guys do. It's an awesome responsibility. And taking care of, you said, the most vulnerable people that we have. You know, we've been fortunate at Newport that our numbers have not, in Newport and Jackson County, mm -hmm. our numbers haven't been real high, and that's a big plus for all of us, no doubt. Right. Uh, uh, final thoughts on the day, ladies and gentlemen. Final thoughts. I want to say thank you to my families, my resident families. I've got friends, of course, you know, nurses, no nurses, no nurses. But I've got people that are DONs and ADONs in other states. And their family members, bless them, they don't mean to, but they're just making it really hard for them to meet the guidelines. And we've been blessed with great family. They've, they've really worked with us. Um, they've done pretty much everything we've asked them to do without hesitation, you know, anything to keep their loved ones safe. So that's what I appreciate. It's made my first week on the job a whole lot easier, and I appreciate that, too. <laughs> Final thought, Jaycox. The crappie are biting. They're down there by that one tree. Yes, sir. They're close. And it's that tree I've been looking for a long time. Yeah, I just, he, he just, he, I, I, last time I asked Jay, I said, where are you catching those crappie? And he showed me, he said, they're right here, right there in the lip. Right there. Around. You know, he'll drop me off to home before y'all go fishing, all right? I you guarantee know? you. I guarantee you. are right there by that tree. So good to see y'all. And again, what a great job that you guys do at St. Michael's Place. Thank, Thank y'all, Ryan. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate you being here. At the Newport Special School District, Mr. Brett Bunch, the superintendent, joins us for our uh, monthly report. The Newport Greyhound Report brought to you by First Community Bank right here in Newport where community comes first. And Mr. Bunch, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for coming in. We had a little visit prior to getting on the air in uh, challenging times for the Newport Greyhounds, but uh, uh, under the current situation, I want to talk a little bit about uh, we've done, we have done some planning prior to, so we're probably in as good a shape, if not better shape, than most. We are. We were very fortunate that we got a heads up uh, really back in, in December. And so when we came back from the Christmas holidays, we actually started planning. Uh, we didn't know what would take place, how it would take place, but we wanted to have something in uh, ready to go in case it, we did uh, have to shut down or stop teaching, and uh, it came to fruition. Uh, but we were very fortunate. Uh, and that, a lot of that credit goes to uh, my IT director, uh, Joy McKnight. Right. He came and visited with me and we sat down and uh, then of course all of my administrators, we got together and, and put together a plan. Well, we're having education as we speak. They say the schools are closed. Well, we're really not closed. We just don't have people at the school. But, but kind of tell how all that works, what all we're doing. Well, we, we plan to get all of our AMI work out. You know, we're very fortunate that we're at Apple School. We're one-to-one -one in most cases. Uh, we do still have to print some packets and get out to some kids. But uh, being able to utilize that technology and understand the challenges that kids are going to go through, uh, we're sending out our work weekly. And then our teachers are available each day to answer questions if kids have them or if parents have them because uh, a lot of parents are home right now. And I can tell you, I think that uh, we're... We're going to come back with a greater uh, respect for teaching. Yes, uh, it's it's a challenge, but at the same at the same time, we're sad because our kids aren't here. Teachers love to have those kids in front of them. That that's what their passion is, and so we plan for that. Then we looked at uh, how are we going to make sure we can successfully feed our kids, and so we put together that plan. We wanted to make sure that we could get information out to all of our kids, no matter how far out in the, in the country they were mm -hmm. or in the community itself. And so uh, we ordered some mobile uh, Wi-Fi um, equipment and have that in, and we're working to set up even more areas for people to, in case we did uh, get shut down from being able to drive out into the community, where they could actually go to, download the work, and then they would still have all that available. 
I know I visited with John Chadwell, the executive director of NEDC, and he he has a, he has a little program going where where you could, if you could get on their parking lot right there, then uh, yes, and, and call them. You can call and get the Wi-Fi number, and you can do your work right there. I mean, it, you know, it's just offering a great service to our community for our kids here in the school. It is, and the great thing is, is they don't even have to stay there to do their work. All right. they do is pull in. They get it downloaded on their system, and they can go home and, and work on it over the week. So uh, really, our technology has allowed us to somewhat be ahead of the game. And then for us to be able to feed all of the, our yeah. kids, uh, we are so fortunate to have Aramark. Carolyn Bain runs that program, does an outstanding job. Uh, her people, I want to also recognize Calvin Heisler and his uh, bus drivers mm -hmm. need to recognize uh, Richard O'Neill and our maintenance crews for all the cleaning and sanitizing that they're doing, uh, along with uh, Justin Wilkins, who is over custodian. So all of those key individuals that normally are behind the scenes in a school system are what really make it run. We have a lot of challenges uh, looking forward, and the challenges aren't just for this school year. Tell us about those. Well, we know that uh, by the time we get back in school, because it's, it's been closed for, for the remainder of this year, even AMI work is, is not going to be the same as having a teacher in that classroom in front of those kids. So there are going to be gaps. There are going to be deficits that we have to fill. And what we're doing as a district is uh, I met with my administrative staff. We put together a plan. We're planning on how to fill those gaps when we return. We also had originally planned a summer program for our elementary kids that is a reading program. We are going to hope that we can get that in this summer. We may have to abbreviate it, we may have to change it, but uh, this is a fluid situation we're living in. Yeah. And with that, we have to be adaptable, we have to make changes as they come along, and that's what we're doing. Well, I know that uh, you drive through the school, and this was a planned day, and we filmed on Good Friday, and it was it was it was a kind of a ghost town to go through, just yes, to think. Sir. Well, it's a, but it was a planned day like that. You still have teachers come. I do. We we have our teachers scheduled, uh, and it's. Uh, I'll give you an example over on the high school side. Like Monday is math day. Tuesday is our English teachers come in. Wednesday our science teachers. So we. Uh, split them up so that we can meet the requirements of the state. They're all spread out in, in separate areas, so uh, we are trying to make it as normal as possible. We don't have kids on campus, but they can still reach them via technology. They can talk to them uh, through emails, and, and a lot of kids are calling to, to get things answered. So we are still in touch with our students, uh, and for everyone in this school district, it's all about the kids. It is that, and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll leave everybody with this, and just uh, for example, you know, we at Newport High School being as proactive as we have been in, in looking back to December and, and uh, bringing staff in when you talked about what might happen, but we're still under the State Department of Education. We still have to go by their guidelines. What they tell us to do is what we've got to do, but you know, they give us a little leeway on some things and some things they don't give us much leeway on. And I have to give them a lot of credit uh, because this is uncharted waters. And when you look across our state, it was like, okay, we're closing next week. Fortunately, we had done some planning. A lot of schools had not planned for that. But the support that the state has given schools, the flexibility that uh, the government has given us from uh, the U.S. government down to the state level and then the state department, uh, I want to commend them on all the hard work they're putting in because they are supporting us as school districts. It's not an easy decision, any of these that you have to make. But uh, in the long run, it's like I've tried to say all along, we're going to come out on the other side better and stronger. Well, it's, like we say, it's been a challenge for us here at the school, but I think the Newport Greyhounds have risen up and uh, uh, accepted the challenge and doing quite well with the scenario that we have, and uh, you do the best we can do, and we're certainly glad that we have Mr. Brett Bunch uh, leading us through this challenge and uh, uh, challenge throughout the world, and even right here in Newport, Arkansas. I would appreciate what you do, my friend. Very blessed to be here and, and very thankful for the people I get to work with and the community I get to work and live in. It's the first community bank report, the Newport Greyhound report. That's Mr. Brett Bunch, the superintendent of the Newport School.